Well, this kind of gives it away. It's a JavaScript runtime. It's not a language. It's a runtime. You see, until 2009, you ran JavaScript code inside of the browser. That's why people didn't really respect JavaScript. They thought it was a silly toy language. Well, Ryan Dahl in 2009 decided it would be great to run it outside the browser. Because up until now, we only had that runtime, that web API and the callback queue and the event loop, all browser-based. So he created Node.js, which is actually a C++ program. You can actually think of it as node.exe. It's an executable, right? A C++ program that provides this runtime for us. And if we look at the Node.js runtime, you see that it looks quite similar with our browser-based runtime, doesn't it? When it comes to Node.js, there are a few differences, but it works the same way as our diagram. We have our V8 engine, and then we have our event loop and what they call our callback queue. And they use something called libuv, which again is written in C++, for us to do these asynchronous operations with the V8 engine. Now, when it comes to Node.js, it does a little bit more than our web browser runtime. You see, in the case of a browser, we're limited to what we can do in the background, right? The browser isn't going to allow us to do much on the person's computer. You can't really access, for example, the file system of the user. I mean, that would be a huge security flaw. It just runs on the browser on the tab that we're currently on in what we call a sandboxed environment. But in Node, we can pretty much do most of the things in the background. We can access file systems, we can do all sorts of things. You see, Node.js uses the Google V8 engine to understand the JavaScript, but it uses this libuv library, which works along to create this event loop to extend what we can do in the background. Now, here's the fun thing. If I install Node.js on my computer, and let's just run Node, if I type in window here, well, I get an error. There's no window like we had in the browser. Instead, Node has something called global, and that's its global API. You see that just like we had with window, in Node, we have this global API that we can use, which also happens to have set timeout, set interval. That's nice, but also has some extra things that we couldn't do in a browser. And that is why Node is set to be a server-side platform based on asynchronous I.O. that is non-blocking. It means that it uses JavaScript, but outside of the browser, but it creates this entire environment, this runtime that runs outside of the browser, and it allows us to have the same model of a single-threaded model, but any asynchronous tasks can be non-blocking. That is, they can be passed on to what we call worker threads in the background to do the work for us and then get sent back through the callback queue and event loop onto the stack. We were able in 2009 to have a different model to perhaps create servers. You see, back in the day, we would create a thread for each request. Something like PHP would work like this. And if what we call the thread pool, that is however much the server can work, is maxed out, well, the requests would just have to wait for the other ones to be available again. Node.js changed this mentality and said, hey, we only have this one single thread. But as soon as you give me a thread, I'm just going to pass it off to my asynchronous runtime to take care of it. And this simplified things a lot. Now, there's pros and cons to each method, but I hope now you see the power of the runtime, how it adds on this extra feature to JavaScript so that we can finally have the capabilities we had in the browser, but also the capabilities outside of the browser. I'll see you in the next video.
Bye-bye. Oh boy. I know that was a long section. And a long section without that much code. I know you want to do exercises and get things going. And I promise you, with the upcoming sections, we're going to do more and more coding. But I wanted for us to build this foundation so that we understand how the language works internally. In this section, we learned about the JavaScript engine, how we can send a JavaScript file and it runs it all through these steps, including an interpreter and a compiler, a JIT compiler, to send us optimized code that we can run on our machines. And then we also learned about these two very important concepts that we're going to take with us throughout the rest of the section, call stack and memory heap, and how these are used to run and execute our code. And more importantly, we focused on the call stack, something that we're going to see over and over throughout the next couple of videos and sections, where we use the stack to keep track of where we are in our program. And this concept is going to be very important when we start to understand JavaScript deeply. We also learn about the idea of a single threaded model. That is, JavaScript is a single threaded language. One call stack, one memory heap. We learned about the limitations of that, but also the beauty and simplicity because we can use the JavaScript runtime to have threads in the background that run it for us, whether it is on the browser. Or... So this is your final test. What happens if I run this again, but this time I'm going to run this in one second and this one in just 10 milliseconds. All right, you ready? Let's see. Okay, is that what you expected? Did you get that right? Good, if you did, move on to the next section. But I have one last question for you. And this is gonna be a little tough. So let's change this back to zero. And this over here, we're gonna change it instead to a promise.resolve. And it's just going to resolve to high. And we're just going to dot then console log two. And by the way, if you're not used to promises, I've added some videos on promises in the appendix, so you can go check those out. This is something that we're gonna learn later on in the course. What do you think is going to happen here? We have a set timeout, then a promise, that resolves right away and console log two and then console log three. Take your guess, wait a second, because I'm gonna press enter and let's see what happens. Is that what you expected? Three is a crowd makes sense, but why did two get printed before one? Does that make sense to you? Because based on what I just taught you, it doesn't, right? How did promise get in before one is the loneliest number? Hmm. Well, in order for us to understand that and to leave you on a cliffhanger, this is something we're gonna tackle in the asynchronous part of the course. But the thing is, before we get to that, we have to really understand some of the more fundamental concepts of JavaScript. I know I'm keeping you in a suspense. You can jump to the asynchronous part of this course if you're really curious. But I suggest that you wait so that we learn about the core JavaScript concepts before we see what's happening here. For now, take a break, and I hope to see you in the next section. Bye-bye. Hello! We're starting an advanced course with how JavaScript works. But I already know how JavaScript works. I write JavaScript every day. Stop wasting my time, Andre. I know you like to give me a hard time, but let me ask you this. When you write code on a file, 
do you know what happens? How does the browser read this file? How is JavaScript executed? How does Node.js work? We write code in a text editor, and somehow this code magically turns into ones and zeros to tell the computer to do something. In this section, and to begin this course, I want to build what I think is the most important foundation of learning any language. If somebody asks you, hey, can you explain how JavaScript works as if I was five? You're going to be able to answer it by the end of this section. Knowing something deeply is being able to understand it so well that you can explain it to anybody, even somebody without technical knowledge. More importantly, you will have an understanding of the language at a deeper level than most people in the industry so that you can write better code. Let's have a look at what we're going to talk about. In the first part, we're going to talk about the JavaScript engine, JavaScript runtime, about interpreters, compilers, and JIT compilers. We're going to learn about writing optimized code. We're going to talk about call stacks, memory heaps, and some of the things that we have to be careful when it comes to stacks and heaps, and that is stack overflow and memory leaks. We're going to talk a little bit about garbage collection, about Node.js and how it fits into this whole JavaScript ecosystem and single threaded model. And using what we learn in this section, we're going to be able to use these fundamentals as we learn higher and higher level concepts as we move throughout the course. So hang in there. Even if you have a good understanding of how JavaScript works, you may learn a thing or two. We're also going to have a little bit of coding, but most exercises in this section are going to be thought experiments. And a lot more code is going to come up in future sections. So hang in there. And I hope you are as excited as I am to start the course. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's get started, shall we? See you in the next one. Almost everyone that has worked with JavaScript has heard of the V8 engine, the idea of the JavaScript engine. And most people know that JavaScript is a single threaded language, that it uses a callback queue. You may also hear phrases like JavaScript is an interpreted language. Let's tackle what that means over the next couple of videos. What is this engine that we speak of? Well, if I write some code, like let's say const is happy equals to true. Well, we just wrote some JavaScript. I'm assigning the true Boolean to the variable is happy. Now, how do we read this? Or how does the computer read this? Imagine if somebody comes up to you and gives you a computer and they tell you, hey, tell this computer to display a picture of horses on the screen. And you start looking at this computer and you tell the computer to display an image of a horse or horses in French. Is the computer going to understand you? No, the computer would have no idea what you just said. In similar fashion, if I gave a computer with a CPU a file that is a JavaScript file, and I tell it, hey, read this file and do something for me, well, the computer only understands ones and zeros at the end of the day. And when we give it the JavaScript file, it's like me talking to a computer in French and the computer being like, uh, what? What are you talking about? Plus, talking to a computer in French, well, people are going to look at you like you're a crazy person. So the computer doesn't really know what JavaScript is. So how are we able to communicate using a JavaScript file so that the computer displays pictures of horses? And this is the first step in our learning, and that is the JavaScript engine. By having a JavaScript engine right over here, it allows you to give this machine the JavaScript file. And this machine is going to understand this file and tell the computer what to do to display pictures of horses. In a sense, you just created a translator. So you can communicate with somebody that doesn't know your language. And this special engine called the JavaScript engine understands JavaScript. Our computer finally understands us because of this JavaScript engine. And it says, I'm on it, boss. I'll start displaying those horse pictures. There you go. That's our first step. And over the next couple of videos, we're going to talk about exactly what's happening inside. 
But do you think there's one JavaScript engine or many JavaScript engines? Well, as you can see from this Wikipedia list, there are a ton of engines. And they're called ECMAScript engines, and we'll get into why that is later. But these are all the JavaScript engines. Some of them you may have heard of, like V8 or SpiderMonkey or Chakra. So anytime we use an engine, we're able to give it a JavaScript file. And this JavaScript file gets understood by the engine, and it allows this engine to communicate and tell the machine, the computer, to do what we ask it to do with JavaScript. Now, these engines are written by programmers. For example, V8 engine is written in C++. But why do people write these engines? 2008 marked a really pivotal moment in history when it comes to JavaScript because V8 was released by Google. Before then, most browsers used engines that were very basic, which meant that JavaScript was a little bit slow. You see, Google had this problem. They had something called Google Maps. And Google Maps, as you know, requires a lot of power. It does a lot of things. You can ask it for directions to zoom in and zoom out, maybe even use Street View. And all the previous engines before it would make Google Maps very, very slow on the browser. And Google, because they're a search engine, they want everybody to use their search engine. And they built a browser in order for them to control more of the market. So with Google Maps and their own Chrome browser, they said, hmm, we're going to write our own JavaScript engine, the V8 engine, so that JavaScript runs way faster on the browser than it's done previously. And in 2008, they released V8. But the big takeaway for us here is that really, really smart people work on these engines so that our JavaScript runs as fast as possible on the browser, on the server, or any type of computer. So every day, JavaScript gets faster and faster for us because of the work that goes into these engines. OK, but what is inside this engine, this magical machine that understands JavaScript? It reads our code, and then it runs this code. Let's get into that in the upcoming video. Bye-bye. Here's a fun little question. Who do you think created the very first JavaScript engine? Just pause and think about this. Give up? Well, the first person to create the very first JavaScript engine was its creator, Brendan Eich, this man right over here. While working at Netscape, which became the first commercially available browser, he created the early version of what became to be known as SpiderMonkey, which is what Firefox still uses right now as their JavaScript engine. And Brendan Eich was the very first person who created the language JavaScript to implement this engine so that you're able to run JavaScript on a browser that previously could only read HTML and CSS. Fun little fact for you. All right, let's get back to the videos. Welcome back. So we know that this thing called the JavaScript engine takes our written JavaScript code and does some magic to tell the computer to do what we want it to do. So what's happening inside of this engine? And here's the tricky part. As we know, this engine can be built by anybody. Yes, that means you can build your own JavaScript engine. But it's a lot of work. And at the end of the day, it's just a program. And the V8 engine, which is the most popular, most common, and some would say the fastest JavaScript engine that the Chrome browser and Node.js uses, which we'll talk about later on, this engine is written in C++, a low-level programming language. But let's see what's actually happening inside here. Inside this engine, it looks something like this. We give it a JavaScript file. And first, it does something called lexical analysis, which breaks the code into something called tokens to identify their meaning so that we know what the code is trying to do. And these tokens are formed into what we call an AST. That is an abstract syntax tree. So we parse the code. That is, we try and figure out how the text is divided up based on 
keywords from JavaScript, and it gets formed into this tree-like structure called abstract syntax tree. And there's a fun little tool online that you can use to demo this. If we go to asdexplorer.net, it'll show you how this abstract syntax tree looks like. And you have a bit of code here. And as you can see, you can look at it in JSON format, or you can use it the tree. And it breaks down the program into different things that are happening. We have a variable declaration, a declarator. And although this may look like gibberish right now to you, this allows the engine to understand what's going on in the program, or at least break things down one by one. And once in this form, it goes through something called an interpreter, profiler, compiler, and we get some sort of code, which we're going to talk about later on. And this whole engine is going to spit out some code that our CPU on our computers is going to understand to give it instructions. And you can think of this whole process, again, which we're going to talk about in more detail coming up, as something like this. We can create our own JavaScript engine by saying function, and let's say JS engine function that takes in some code. And this code is going to return for us, let's say code.split. And we'll use some regex here just to split up our code. And now if I write some code here, let's say JS engine, and we give it our code, which will be a string that says variable a equals to five. Look at that. We've created a simple engine. I know, I know there's a lot more complexities to it than that. But that's what it's doing. We're giving it a piece of code, which just gets stringified. And then it tries and breaks things down into different parts so that maybe in this function, we can say, if you see variable keyword, that means whatever comes after it is a variable that we're going to assign, and so on and so forth. But you might see a problem here. What problem or problems do you see with everybody creating their own engines in JavaScript? Just like we did, right? Can we just create our own engine and all of a sudden, boom, there it is. We have our JavaScript engine. Well, yes, you can definitely do that. But remember our list over here, how it was called ECMAScript engines and not JavaScript engines. That's because if everybody can just create a JavaScript engine, it'll just be total chaos, which is why ECMAScript was created. It tells people, hey, here's the standard and how you should do things in JavaScript and how it should work. And ECMAScript is the governing body of JavaScript that essentially decides how the language should be standardized. So it tells engine creators, this is how JavaScript should work. But internally, how you build the engine is up to you as long as it conforms to these standards. And if we go back to our example over here, this engine, inside of this box, as long as it conforms to ECMAScript standards, I can do whatever I want as an engine creator. So companies and organizations are battling to have the fastest engine so people use their tool. For example, Google is really interested in having the fastest engine 